All right, today we're going to talk about the uh, Italian Renaissance. I'm going to divide this lecture into three parts. The first part will be an overview of um, the major concepts we're going to cover and a little bit of coverage of history as to how we got here. And then uh, the second part will be covering the sort of upper class, elite, visually extravagant uh, innovations of the Renaissance. And the third part will cover the uh, Commedia dell'arte, improvisational comedy, theater for the people approach to the Renaissance. So, historically we talk about the Renaissance as the beginning of a massive change in Europe. We're really moving out of a very um, medieval mindset and moving towards a handful of different important things, uh, including, not the least of which, is humanism. And just to sum it up very briefly, there are about 1,500 definitions out there in the world for humanism. But the one that I want to talk about and really focus on is the notion that you as an individual are important. And you're important in and of your own right and on your own terms. So humanism steps away from, not totally away from, but steps kind of away from religion in saying that you aren't just here on earth to worship God, what you want matters. And humanism steps kind of away from monarchy in that it says you're not just here to pay homage to the king and do whatever he says, what you want matters. Now, as you can see, these are kind of the seeds of democracy, but we don't get to democracy for a really long time. So we're just starting to edge in that direction. And then liberalism is obviously another part of this, the, um, the notion that philosophy and broad education and learning of all kinds of different things is an important thing to do. And one of those things we learned about a lot in the uh, Renaissance is massive and incredible developments in science and technology in a bunch of different ways. Renaissance architecture certainly is a big deal. You go to Italy or Greece or Rome or anywhere these days and you can see... Um, the remnants of numerous scientific and intellectual, uh, scientific and architectural developments. And then overall, the Renaissance demonstrates that, uh, um, or allows people to pursue intellectual things rather than just, again, to compare to the medieval era, rather than just religious things and boring stay alive things. Um, so those intellectual pursuits are a really big part of you know, poetry, sculpture, painting, theater, novels, all sorts of intellectual and um, science and philosophy pursuits are, are a big deal in terms of what's going on during the Renaissance. In terms of theater, the Italian Renaissance heads off in two directions, and those are the two I talked about. Uh, direction number one is a visual and academic direction, where we are interested largely in visual recreation of Greek and Roman modes of theater. And there's that neoclassical idea there. Whatever the Greeks and Romans did, that was a good idea, so we're going to do it. And that, that represents itself in a very upper-class, elitist kind of way, which I'll talk about later. And the other side of it is a performative or more popular theater for the people of Commedia dell'arte, which uh, we'll talk about as well. And they're really different directions, and they have a few similarities, but mainly there's a, there's a big uh, um, separation between the two. So, how did we get here? Always an important question. When we last left... Europe, before the Renaissance, we were in the medieval era, which was stooped in, uh, steeped in eh, sort of a lack of intelligence and a desire to survive, right, to farm enough food to live, um, a very tiny mindset where you don't know much about the world around you and where the world around you doesn't really matter um, because you, you don't really care about it, can't get to it. We shift from that into a much more open-minded society through a handful of sort of historical minds, minds, uh, milestones. One of those is the Crusades. From 1096 to 1229, numerous different European kings decide that they want to take back Israel, or the Holy Land, right? Specifically, Jesus' birthplace and the locations of the New Testament. And so, a given king will get up an army, ride all the way across Europe and all the way across Turkey to get to, or take a ship to get to the... Uh, um, Middle East and fight a war with the uh, Islamic cultures there who have taken over. The Crusades are certainly not a good thing, but one thing they do is they get a lot of Europeans out of Europe and associating with other cultures. Now, mainly they're trying to kill those other cultures, but there is nonetheless some cultural mixing, and there are the development of trade routes as well. So the discovery of spices from the East and of textiles, right, silk and other very um, sort of Middle Eastern and Eastern goods and services, we're opening up that, mid that closed medieval world to other parts of the world. We already talked about this in the medieval lecture. When the plague comes along in the 1350s and kills a third of everybody, that actually has a positive impact on the uh, Renaissance or medieval slash Renaissance economy. 
We have fewer people, the same amount of natural resources, so we have more money. Uh, and one of the things the Renaissance requires is a, uh, an increasingly positive economy to support all of this trade and all this intellectual pursuit. As we all know, in the 1440s, Gutenberg invents the first printing press. Now, we always talk about the printing press in terms of, like, um, it democratized knowledge. It allowed the common people to own books. Well, kind of. It started us down that road, certainly. A book in the 1440s or 1500s still costs as much as a car would cost today. So the common people really didn't own a lot of books. Nonetheless, the printing press does start to give us the opportunity to reproduce books at kind of a mass scale, and we can kind of distribute knowledge a little bit more efficiently. So we're headed in the right direction. Now, here's the next important thing that happens. In 1453, the Ottoman Turks, these are right Muslim cultures in Turkey, they invade Constantinople. As you may know, they changed the name from Constantinople to Istanbul. More importantly, when they invade Constantinople, Constantinople is the heart of the Christian Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, and so we talked about this when we talked about the fall of Rome. Go way back in your notes and in your brains to right, Rome in the 400s AD falls. Goths and Visigoths and Vandals and these tribal cultures come into Rome in the 400s and sack it. Uh, and so one of the things that happens is the Roman Empire splits. And as you recall, when Rome starts getting attacked by these tribal outsiders, all of the intellectuals in Rome who had all these documents of the, of the Roman culture, we're talking, again, we're talking again like 400 AD, all these intellectuals who have the records of Rome and the scientific advancements of Rome and the architectural documents and the Roman plays and the Roman philosophy written down, they take all those documents and they run off to Constantinople. Fast forward almost a thousand years later and the descendants of those same people are in Constantinople. And when the Ottoman Turks show up, they grab all of their precious Roman documents that are now a thousand or more years old, and they come back to Italy. So they jump on the boat when the Turks are invading Constantinople and say, we're getting the heck out of here. Where should we go? They end up going to Italy. So you have this reintroduction of all of this lost classical knowledge from Greece and Rome. It is reintroduced into the world in the 1400s, right at the same time the printing press is invented to distribute that knowledge in a, uh, a slightly more efficient way. So, we get this notion of a growing economy. We add to that explosion of secular, non-religious knowledge, specifically from Greece and Rome, and we get a renaissance. People have money to spend, and they have knowledge that they are able to pursue and interested in pursuing. And that is really how we get to this notion of the renaissance. So, a lot of people ask the question, why Italy? Well, geographically, it sticks out in the middle of the uh, Mediterranean. So. That's one of the reasons um, that when you get on a boat from Constantinople and you flee, Italy is a natural landing point, right? Um, so it's a center for trade. There's a ton of wealth. And it's also the center of the Catholic Church still in the 1400s. The Catholic Church is dominant in Europe. And so it's a religious center, which means a lot of people are there. And it also, because it's such a, a powerful trading nation, it has tons of money and tons of international influence. One of the things that the Italians do with all that money as they build a lot of universities. So the wealthy people of Europe send their kids to Italy to go to college. So all of this Greek and Roman knowledge and all this liberal arts learning is really um, um, sort of centered in Italy where all of the wealthy people of Europe are going to college. So there are this, this sort of confluence of coincidences and um, sort of economic factors and religious factors that make Italy the heart of the Renaissance. So in these universities, we get this notion of secular humanism. As I talked about, the notion that um, we can study the world scientifically and thoughtfully without conflicting with religion. And that you know we can understand the world in a more philosophical and scientific way rather than just saying, all right, whatever God says is the truth we get a lot more secular humanism, right? And in the nation of universities in Italy, right, all the different universities in Italy, they're not doing job training. If you're a wealthy kid from, say, France, right, if you're the son of the Duke of whatever, and your dad sends you to college in Italy, you don't need job training. You just, your dad just wants you to go and become a smarter person. So we have this liberal arts approach to learning. 
which is really key to understanding the kind of um, sort of knowledge that, that comes out during the Renaissance. This is where we get the phrase, the Renaissance man, somebody who knows a little bit about everything. So if you go to college in an Italian university in the 1400s, you're going to learn Latin, you're going to learn Greek, you're going to learn classical cultures, you're going to learn a little bit of poetry, a little bit of theater, a little bit about novels, a little bit about everything, right? In a really impractical way, but in a way that embraces a broad learning approach. So we're developing this culture in Italy, um, and what we're doing fundamentally then is learning for the sake of learning which is a huge departure from the medieval era, where the only reason you learn anything is so you could be a better Catholic. Now, we're learning stuff just to kind of get to know it, um, which is a big stepping away from uh, sort of how things had been in the, in the medieval era. The key factor here that exists that allows this to work is religion. Obviously, the Catholic Church is dominant in Italy. The Pope controls Many of the um, cultural, uh, sort of the, the politics and the culture of uh, Italy are defined by it being the home of the Catholic Church. But in the 13th century, the Catholic Church makes a really important distinction. They say there is this classical logic. There is this Aristotelian scientific logic on the one hand. And on the other hand, there is religious logic. And there are places where those two things appear to contradict. For example, think about Noah's Ark. Every single species on the whole planet can fit on one boat, and that boat can carry all those animals and enough food to survive for 40 days and 40 nights. From a, an Aristotelian scientific logical approach, that seems not possible. What the church says is, well, there's Aristotelian scientific logic on one side, and on the other side there's religious logic. And during the whole medieval era, religious logic had just overridden everything, right? If science conflicts with religion, then religion wins. In the 13th century, however, the church doesn't say religion has to win all the time. The church says, we can have both. And they may contradict, but that's okay, because they're different kinds of logic. That decision was hugely important in allowing the Renaissance to continue. Because if the church had said religious logic is always correct, then we can't get this liberal arts, classical-minded learning um, that we have that defines the Renaissance. Also, a lot of historians make the point that education, liberal arts education, does lead to greater wealth, right? Smarter people um, develop more efficient trade routes, run more efficient businesses, bring more money to the church, and you've got families like the Medicis, who are incredibly powerful, who bring wealth and donate that wealth to the church, and the church tends to be a lot more tolerant of secular thinking when that secular thinking leads to high dollar sign income. And that's what's happening during this era. So the church looks and says, all right, we don't want to squash all this liberal arts education because it does in some ways lead to wealth, which, all right, we're willing to tolerate that. So we'll pick up in the next section about entertainment contexts.